The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 12, Side 2. The sword of the samurai was stronger than his dwelling, for the metal workers of Japan spent themselves on making blades superior to those of Damascus or Toledo, sharp enough to sever a man from shoulder to thigh at a blow, and ornamented with guards and handles so highly decorated or so heavily inlaid with gems that they were not always perfectly adapted to homicide. Other workers in metal made bronze mirrors so brilliant that legends arose to commemorate their perfection. So a peasant, having bought a mirror for the first time, thought that he recognized in it the face of his dead father. He hid it as a great treasure, but so often consulted it that his suspicious wife ferreted it out, and was horrified to find in it the picture of a woman about her own age, who was apparently her husband's mistress. Still other artisans cast tremendous bells, like the forty-nine-ton monster at Nara, 732 A.D., and brought from them a sweeter tone than our clanging metal clappers elicit in the West by striking a boss on the outer surface of the bell with a swinging beam of wood. The sculptors used wood or metal rather than stone, since their soil was poor in granite and marble. And yet, despite all difficulties of material, they came to surpass their Chinese and Korean teachers in this most definitive of all the arts for every other art secretly emulates sculpture's patient removal of the inappropriate. Almost the earliest and perhaps the greatest masterpiece of sculpture in Japan is the bronze trinity at Horiuji, a Buddha seated on a lotus bud between two bodhisattvas, before a screen and halo of bronze only less beautiful than the stone lacery of Aurangzeb's screen in the Taj Mahal. We do not know whose hands reared these temples and built this statuary. We may admit Korean teachers— Chinese examples, Indian motives, even Greek influences coming down from far Ionia across a thousand years. But we are sure that this trinity is among the most signal accomplishments in the history of art. Possibly because their stature was short and their bodies could hardly contain all the ambitions and capacities of their souls, the Japanese took pleasure in building colossi and had better success in this questionable art than even the Egyptians. In the year 747, an epidemic of smallpox having broken out in Japan, the Emperor Shomu commissioned Kimimaro to cast a gigantic Buddha in propitiation of the gods. For this purpose, Kimimaro used 437 tons of bronze, 288 pounds of gold, 165 pounds of mercury, seven tons of vegetable wax, and several tons of charcoal. Two years and seven attempts were required for the work. The head was cast in a single mold, but the body was formed of several metal plates soldered together and thickly covered with gold. More impressive to the foreign eye than this Saturnine countenance at Nara is the Daibutsu of Kamakura, cast of bronze in 1252 by Ono Goroyemon. Here, perhaps because the Colossus sits on an elevation in the open air, within a pleasant entourage of trees, the size seems to accord with the purpose, and the artist has expressed with remarkable simplicity the spirit of Buddhist contemplation and peace. Once a temple housed the figure, as is still the case at Nara, but in 1495 a great tidal wave destroyed both the temple and the town, leaving the bronze philosopher serene amid widespread destruction, suffering, and death. Hideyoshi too built a colossus at Kyoto. For five years fifty thousand men labored at this Buddha, and the great Taiko himself, clad in the garb of a common laborer, sometimes helped them conspicuously at their task. But hardly had it been erected when in 1596 an earthquake threw it down and scattered the wreckage of its sheltering sanctuary about its head. Hideyoshi, says Japanese story, shot an arrow at the fallen idol, saying scornfully, I placed you here at great expense, and you cannot even defend your own temple. From such colossi to the dangling Netsuke, Japanese sculpture ran the range of every figure and every size. Sometimes its masters, like Takamura today, gave years of labor to figures hardly a foot tall, and took delight in representing gnarled octogenarians, jolly gourmands, and philosophic friars. It was good that humor sustained them, for most of the gains that came from their toil went to their subtle employers rather than to themselves, and in their larger works they were much harassed by conventions of subject and treatment laid upon them by the priests. The priests wanted gods, not courtesans, from the sculptors. They wished to inspire the people to piety, or to fashion their virtues with fear, rather than to arouse in them the sense and ecstasy of beauty. Bound hand and soul to religion, sculpture decayed when faith lost its warmth and power and, as in Egypt, the stiffness of conventions when piety had fled became the rigor of death. 8. Pottery The Chinese Stimulus, the Potters of Hizen, Pottery and Tea, 
how Goto Saijiro brought the art of porcelain from Hizen to Kaga, the nineteenth century. In a sense, it is not quite just to Japan to speak of her importing civilization from Korea and China, except in the sense in which northwestern Europe took its civilization from Greece and Rome. We might also view all the peoples of the Far East as one ethnic and cultural unity, in which each part, like the provinces of one country, produced in its time and place an art and culture akin to and dependent upon the art and culture of the rest. So Japanese pottery is a part and phase of Far Eastern ceramics, fundamentally like the Chinese, and yet stamped with the characteristic delicacy and fineness of all Japanese work. Until the coming of the Korean artisans in the seventh century, Japanese pottery was merely an industry, molding crude materials for common use. There was apparently no glazed pottery in the Far East before the eighth century, much less any porcelain. The industry became an art largely as a result of the entrance of tea in the thirteenth century. Chinese teacups of Sung design came in with tea and aroused the admiration of the Japanese. In the year 1223, Kato Shirozemon, a Japanese potter, made his way perilously to China, studied ceramics there for six years, returned to set up his own factory at Seto, and so far surpassed all preceding pottery in the islands that Seto Mono, or Seto ware, became a generic name for all Japanese pottery, just as China ware in the 17th century became the English term for porcelain. The shogun Yoritomo made Shirozemon's future by setting the fashion of rewarding minor services with presents of Shirozemon's tea jars, filled with the new marvel of powdered tea. Today the surviving specimens of this Toshiro Yaki are accounted almost beyond price. They are swathed in costly brocade and kept in boxes of the finest lacquer, while their owners are spoken of with bated breath as the aristocracy of connoisseurs. Three hundred years later another Japanese, Shonzui, was lured to China to study its famous potteries. On his return he established a factory at Arita in the province of Hizen. He was harassed, however, by the difficulty of finding in the soil of his country minerals as well adapted as those of China to make a fine pot, and it was said of his products that one of their main ingredients was the bones of his artisans. Nevertheless, Shonzui's wares of Mohammedan blue were so excellent that the Chinese potters of the eighteenth century did their best to imitate them for export under his counterfeited name, and the extant examples of his work are now as highly valued as the rarest paintings of Japan's greatest masters of the brush. About 1605, a Korean, Ri Pei, discovered at Izumiyama, in the Arita district, immense deposits of porcelain stone, and from that moment he then became the center of the ceramic industry in Japan. In Arita, too, labored the famous Kakaimon, who, after learning the art of enameling from a Chinese shipmaster, made his name almost synonymous with delicately decorated enameled porcelain. Dutch merchants shipped large quantities of Hizen products to Europe, from the port of Arita at Imari. 44,943 pieces went to Holland alone in the year 1664. This brilliant Imari Yaki became the rage in Europe and inspired Abrecht de Kaiser to inaugurate the golden age of Dutch ceramics in his factories at Delft. Meanwhile, the rise of the tea ceremony had stimulated a further development in Japan. In 1578, Nobunaga, at the suggestion of the tea master Rikyu, gave a large order for cups and other tea utensils to a family of Korean potters at Kyoto. A few years later, Hideyoshi rewarded the family with a gold seal, and made its wares the Rakuyaki, almost de rigueur for the ritual of drinking tea. Hideyoshi's generals returned from their unsuccessful invasion of Korea with numerous captives, among whom, by a discrimination unusual in warriors, were many artists. In 1596, Shimazu Yoshihiro brought to Satsuma a hundred skilled Koreans, including seventeen potters, and these men, with their successors, established throughout the world the high reputation of Satsuma for that richly colored glazed ware to which an Italian town has given our name of Faience. But the greatest Japanese master in this branch of the art was the Kyoto potter Ninsei. Not only did he originate enameled Faience, but he gave to his products a grace and proud restraint that have made them precious to collectors ever since so that his mark has been more often counterfeited than that of any other artist in Japan. Because of his work, decorated faience mounted to the intensity of a craze in the capital, and in some quarters of Kyoto every second house was turned into a miniature pottery. Only less famous than Ninsei was Kenzan, older brother of the painter Corinne. The romance that so often lurks behind ceramics appears in the story of how Goto Saijiro brought the art of porcelain from Hizen to Kaga, an excellent bed of potter's stone having been discovered near the village of Kutani, 
the feudal lord of the province resolved to establish a porcelain industry there, and Goto was sent to Hizen to study its methods of firing and design. But the secrets of the potters were so carefully concealed from outsiders that Goto for a while was baffled. Finally he disguised himself as a servant and accepted a menial place in the household of a potter. After three years his master admitted him to a pottery, and there Goto worked for four years more. Then he deserted the wife whom he had married at Hizen and the children whom she had borne to him, and fled to Kaga, where he gave his lord a full report of the methods he had learned. From that time on, 1664, the potters of Kutani became masters, and Kutaniyaki rivaled the best wares of Japan. The Hizen potteries retained their leadership throughout the 18th century, largely as a result of the benevolent care which the feudal lord of Hirado lavished upon the workmen in his factories. For a century, 1750 to 1843, the blue Michiwaki wares of Hirado stood at the head of Japanese porcelains. In the nineteenth century, Zengoro Hozen brought the leadership to Kyoto by clever imitations that often surpassed his models, so that sometimes it became impossible to decide which was the original and which was the copy. In the final quarter of the century, Japan developed cloisonné enameling from the crude condition in which it had remained since its entry from China, and took the lead of the world in this field of ceramics. Other branches deteriorated during the same period, for the rising demand of Europe for Japanese pottery led to a style of exaggerated decoration, alien to the native taste, and the habits engendered in meeting these foreign orders affected the skill and weakened the traditions of the art. Here, as everywhere, the coming of industry has been for a while a blight. Mass production has taken the place of quality, and mass consumption has replaced discriminating taste. Perhaps after invention has run its fertile course, and social organization and experience have spread the gift of leisure and taught its creative use, the curse may be turned into a blessing. Industry may lavish comforts upon the majority of men, while the worker, after paying his lowered tribute of hours to the machine, may once again become an artisan, and turn the mechanical product, by loving individual treatment, into a work of personality and art. 9. Painting. Difficulties of the subject, methods and materials, forms and ideals, Korean origins and Buddhist inspiration, the Tosa school, the return to China, Seshu, the Kano school, Koyetsu and Korin, the realistic school. Japanese painting, even more than the other topics that have demanded a place in these pages, is a subject that only specialists should touch, and if it is included here along with other esoteric realms wherein angels have feared to tread, it is in the hope that through this veil of errors some glimpse may come to the reader of the fullness and quality of Japanese civilization. The masterpieces of Japanese painting cover a period of twelve hundred years, are divided amongst a complex multiplicity of schools, have been lost or injured in the flow of time, and are nearly all hidden away in private collections in Japan. Those few chefs d'oeuvre that are open to alien study are so different in form, method, style, and material from Western pictures that no competent judgment can be passed upon them by the Occidental mind. First of all, like their models in China, the paintings of Japan were once made with the same brush that was used in writing, and as in Greece, the word for writing and for painting was originally one. Painting was a graphic art. This initial fact has determined half the characteristics of Far Eastern painting, from the materials used to the subordination of color to line. The materials are simple, ink or watercolors, a brush and absorbent paper or silk. The labor is difficult. The artist works not erect but on his knees, bending over the silk or paper on the floor, and he must learn to control his stroke so as to make seventy-one different degrees or styles of touch. In the earlier centuries, when Buddhism ruled the art of Japan, frescoes were painted, much in the manner of Ajanta or Turkestan. But nearly all the extant works of high repute take the form either of makimono, scrolls, kakemono, hangings, or screens. These pictures were made not to be arranged indigestibly in picture galleries, for there are no such galleries in Japan, but to be viewed in private by the owner and his friends, or to form a part of some decorative scheme in a temple, a palace, or a home. They were very seldom portraits of specific personalities. Usually they were glimpses of nature, or scenes of martial action, or strokes of humorous or satirical observation of the ways of animals, women, and men. They were poems of feeling rather than representations of things, and were closer to philosophy than to photography. The Japanese artist let realism alone, and rarely tried to imitate the external form of reality. He scornfully left out shadows as irrelevant to essences, preferring to paint in plein air, with no modeling play of light and shadow, 
and he smiled at Western insistence on the prospective reduction of distant things. In Japanese painting, said Hokusai, with philosophic tolerance, form and color are represented without any attempt at relief, but in European methods relief and illusion are sought for. The Japanese artist wished to convey a feeling rather than an object, to suggest rather than to represent. It was unnecessary in his judgment to show more than a few significant elements in a scene. As in a Japanese poem, only so much should be shown as would arouse the appreciative mind to contribute to the aesthetic result by its own imagination. The painter, too, was a poet, and valued the rhythm of line and the music of forms infinitely more than the haphazard shape and structure of things. And like the poet, he felt that if he were true to his own feeling, it would be realism enough. It was probably Korea that brought painting to the restless empire that now has conquered her. Korean artists presumably painted the flowing and colorful frescoes of the Horiuji Temple, for there is nothing in the known history of Japan before the seventh century that could explain the sudden native achievement of such faultless excellence. The next stimulus came directly from China through the studies there of the Japanese priests Kobo Daishi and Dengyo Daishi. On his return to Japan in 806, Kobo Daishi gave himself to painting as well as to sculpture, literature, and piety, and some of the oldest masterpieces are from his many-sided brush. Buddhism stimulated art in Japan as it had done in China. The Zen practice of meditation lent itself to brooding creativeness in color and form almost as readily as in philosophy and poetry, and visions of Amida Buddha became as frequent in Japanese art as annunciations and crucifixions on the walls and canvases of the Renaissance. The priest Yeshin Sozu, who died in 1017, was the Fra Angelico and El Greco of this age, whose risings and descendings of Amida made him the greatest religious painter in the history of Japan. By this time, however, Kosei no Kanaoka, who flourished circa 950, had begun the secularization of Japanese painting. Birds, flowers, and animals began to rival gods and saints on the scrolls. But Kosei's brush still thought in Chinese terms and moved along Chinese lines. It was not till the suspension of intercourse with China in the ninth century had given Japan the first of five centuries of isolation that she began to paint her own scenery and subjects in her own way. About 1150, under the patronage of imperial and aristocratic circles at Kyoto, a national school of painting arose which protested against imported motives and styles and set itself to decorate the luxurious homes of the capital with the flowers and landscapes of Japan. The school had almost as many names as it had masters. Yamato Ryu, or Japanese style. Waga Ryu, again meaning Japanese style. Kasuga, after its reputed founder. And finally, the Tosa school, after its principal representative in the 13th century, Tosogo no Kumi. Thereafter, to the end of its history, the name Tosa was borne by all the artists of the line. They deserved their nationalist name, for there is nothing in Chinese art that corresponds to the ardor and dash the variety and humor of the narrative scrolls of love and war which came from the brushes of this group. Takayoshi, about 1010, painted in colors gorgeous illustrations of the seductive tale of Genji. Toba Sojo amused himself by drawing lively satires of the priestly and other scoundrels of his time under the guise of monkeys and frogs. Fujiwara Takanobu, towards the end of the 12th century, finding his high lineage worthless in terms of rice and sake, turned to the brush for a living and drew great portraits of Yoritomo and others, quite unlike anything yet done in China. His son Fujiwara Nobuzane patiently painted the portraits of thirty-six poets, and in the thirteenth century Kasuga's son, Keion, or someone else, drew those animated scrolls which are among the world's most brilliant achievements in the field of draftsmanship. Slowly these narrative sources of inspiration seem to dry up into conventional forms and styles, and Japanese art turned once more for nourishment to the new schools of painting that had arisen in the China of the Sung Renaissance. The impulse to imitation was for a time uncontrolled. Japanese artists who had never seen the Middle Kingdom spent their lives in painting Chinese characters and scenes. Cho Densu painted sixteen rakan, lohans, arhats, Buddhist saints, now among the treasures of the Freer Gallery in Washington. Shubun took the precaution of being born and reared in China, so that on coming to live in Japan he could paint Chinese landscapes from memory, as well as from imagination. It was during the second Chinese mood of Japanese painting that the greatest figure in all the pictorial art of Japan appeared. Seshu was a Zen priest at Sokokuji, one of the several art schools established by Yoshimitsu, the Ashitikaga Shogun. Even as a youth he astonished his townsmen with his draftsmanship. 
and legend, not knowing how to express its awe, told how, when he was tied to a post for misbehavior, he had drawn with his toes such realistic mice that they came to life and bit through the cords that bound him. Hungry to know the masters of Ming China at first hand, he secured credentials from his religious superiors as well as from the shogun, and sailed across the sea. He was disappointed to find that Chinese painting was in decay, but he consoled himself with the varied life and culture of the great kingdom, and went back to his own land filled and inspired with a thousand ideas. The artists and nobles of China, says a pretty tale, accompanied him to the vessel which was to take him back to Japan, and showered white paper upon him with requests that he should paint a few strokes, if no more, upon them, and send them back. Hence, according to this story, his pen name Seshu, meaning Ship of Snow. Arrived in Japan, he seems to have been welcomed as a prince, and to have been offered many emoluments by the shogun Yoshimasa. But if we may believe what we read, he refused these favors and retired to his country parish in Choshu. Now he threw off, as if each were a moment's trifle, one masterpiece after another, until nearly every phase of Chinese scenery and life had taken lasting form under his brush. Seldom had China, never had Japan, seen paintings so various in scope, so vigorous in conception and execution, so decisive in line. In his old age the artists of Japan made a path to his door and honored him, even before his death as a supreme artist. Today a picture of Seshiyu is to a Japanese collector what a Leonardo is to a European. And legend, which transforms intangible opinions into pretty tales, tells how one possessor of a Seshiyu, finding himself caught in a conflagration beyond possibility of escape, slashed open his body with his sword, and plunged into his abdomen the priceless scroll, which was later found unharmed within his half-consumed corpse. The ascendancy of Chinese influence continued among the many artists patronized by the feudal lords of the Ashikaga and Tokugawa shogunates. Each baronial court had its official painter, who was commissioned to train hundreds of young artists who might be turned at a moment's notice to the decoration of a palace. The temples now were almost ignored, for art was being secularized in proportion as wealth increased. Towards the end of the fifteenth century, Kano Masanobu established at Kyoto, under Ashikaga patronage, a school of secular painters known from his first name and devoted to upholding the severely classical and Chinese traditions in Japanese art. His son, Kano Motonobu, reached in this direction a mastery second only to that of Seshu himself. A story told of him illustrates admirably the concentration of mind and purpose that constitutes the greater part of genius. Having been commissioned to paint a series of cranes, Motonobu was discovered, evening after evening, walking and behaving like a crane. It turned out that he imitated each night the crane that he planned to paint the following day. A man must go to bed with his purpose in order to wake up to fame. Motonobu's grandson, Kano Yetoku, Though a scion of the Kano line, developed under the protection of Hideyoshi an ornate style all the world away from the restrained classicism of his progenitors. Tanyu transferred the seat of the school from Kyoto to Yedo, took service under the Tokugawas, and helped to decorate the mausoleum of Ieyasu at Nikko. Gradually, despite these adaptations to the spirit of the times, the Kano dynasty exhausted its impetus and Japan turned to other masters for fresh beginnings. About 1660 a new group of painters arrived on the scene, named from its leaders the Koyetsu Korin School. In the natural oscillation of philosophies and styles, the Chinese manners and subjects of Seshu and Kano seemed now conservative and worn out, and the new artists turned to domestic scenes and motives for their subject matter and inspiration. Koyetsu was a man of such diverse talents as bring to mind Carlyle's jealous claim that he had never known any great man who could not have been any sort of a great man, for he was distinguished as a calligrapher, a painter, and a designer in metal, lacquer, and wood. Like William Morris, he inaugurated a revival of fine printing, and supervised a village in which his craftsmen pursued their varied arts under his direction. His only rival for the first place among the painters of the Tokugawa age was Korin, that astonishing master of trees and flowers, who, his contemporaries tell us, could with one stroke of his brush place a leaf of iris upon the silk and make it live. No other painter has been so purely and completely Japanese, or so typically Japanese, in the taste and delicacy of his work. The last of the historic schools of Japanese painting in the strictest sense was founded at Kyoto in the eighteenth century by Maruyami Okyo. A man of the people, Okyo, stimulated by some knowledge of European painting, resolved to abandon the now thinned-out idealism and impressionism of the older style,
and to attempt a realistic description of simple scenes from everyday life. He became especially fond of drawing animals and kept many species of them about him as objects of his brush. Having painted a wild boar, he showed his work to hunters and was disappointed to find that they thought his pictured boar was dead. He tried again and again until at last they admitted that the boar might not be dead but merely asleep. Since the aristocracy at Kyoto was penniless, Okyo had to sell his pictures to the middle classes, and this economic compulsion had much to do with turning him to popular subjects, even to the painting of some Kyoto bells. The older artists were horrified, but Okyo persisted in his unconventional ways. Mori Sosen accepted Okyo's naturalistic lead, turned and lived with the animals in order to portray them faithfully, and became Japan's greatest painter of monkeys and deer. By the time Okyo died in 1795, the realists had won all along the line, and a completely popular school had captured the attention not only of Japan, but of the world. 10. Prince The Ukiyoye School, its founders, its masters, Hokusai, Hiroshige. It is another jest of history that Japanese art should be most widely known and influential in the West through that one of all its forms which is least honored in Japan. About the middle of the 18th century, the art of engraving, which had come to Japan in the luggage of Buddhism half a millennium before, was turned to the illustration of books and the life of the people. The old subjects and methods had lost the tang of novelty and interest. Men were surfeited with Buddhist saints, Chinese philosophers, meditative animals, and immaculate flowers. The new classes that were slowly rising to prominence looked to art for some reflection of their own affairs and began to produce artists willing to meet these demands. Since painting required leisure and expense, and produced but one picture at a time, the new artists adapted engraving to their purposes, cut their pictures into wood, and made as many cheap prints from the blocks as their democratic purchasers required. These prints were at first colored by hand. Then about 1740, three blocks were made, one uncolored, another partly colored rose red, the third colored here and there in green, and the paper was impressed upon each block in turn. Finally, in 1764, Haru Nobu made the first polychrome prints and paved the way for those vivid sketches by Hokusai and Hiroshige, which proved so suggestive and stimulating to the culture-weary Europeans thirsting for novelty. So was born the Ukiyoye school of pictures of the passing world. Its painters were not the first who had taken the untitled man as the object of their art. Iwasa Matabei, early in the seventeenth century, had shocked the samurai by depicting, on a six-panel screen, men, women, and children in the unrestrained attitudes of common life. In 1900 this screen, the Hokone Biobu, was chosen by the Japanese government for exhibition in Paris, and was insured on its voyage for 30,000 yen, $15,000. About 1660, Ishikawa Moronobu, a designer of Kyoto dress patterns, made the earliest block prints, first for the illustration of books, then as broadsheets scattered among the people, almost like picture postcards among ourselves today. About 1687, Toru Kujomoto, designer of posters for the Osaka theaters, moved to Yedo, taught the Ukiyoye school, which belonged entirely to the capital, how profitable it might be to make prints of the famous actors of the day. From the stage, the new artists passed to the brothels of the Yoshiwara and gave to many a fragile beauty a taste of immortality. Bare breasts and gleaming limbs entered with disarming coyness into the once religious and philosophical sanctuaries of Japanese painting. The masters of the developed art appeared towards the middle of the eighteenth century. Harunobu made prints of twelve or even fifteen colors from as many blocks, and, remorseful over his early pictures for the stage, painted with typical Japanese delicacy the graceful world of happy youth. Kiyonaga reached the first zenith of artistry in this school, and wove color and line into the swaying and yet erect figures of aristocratic women. Shiraku seems to have given only two years of his life to designing prints, but in this short time he lifted himself to the top of his tribe by his portraits of the forty-seven ronin and his savagely ironic pictures of the stage's shooting stars. Utamaro, rich in versatility and genius, master of line and design, etched the whole range of life from insects to courtesans. He spent half his career in the Yoshiwara, exhausted himself in pleasure and work, and earned a year in jail, in 1804, by picturing Hideyoshi with five concubines. Wearied of normal people in normal attitudes, Utamaro portrayed his refined and complacent ladies in almost spiritual slenderness, with tilted heads, 
elongated and slanting eyes, lengthened faces, and mysterious figures wrapped in flowing and multitudinous robes. A degenerating taste exalted this style into a bizarre mannerism, and was bringing the ukiyo-e school close to corruption and decay when its two most famous masters arose to give it another half-century of life. The old man mad with painting, as Hokusai called himself, lived almost fourscore years and ten, but mourned the tardiness of perfection and the brevity of life. From my sixth year onwards a peculiar mania for drawing all sorts of things took possession of me. At my fiftieth year I had published quite a number of works of every possible description, but none were to my satisfaction. Real work began with me only in my seventieth year. Now at seventy-five the real appreciation of nature awakens within me. I therefore hope that at eighty I may have arrived at a certain power of intuition which will develop further to my ninetieth year, so that at the age of a hundred I can probably assert that my intuition is thoroughly artistic. And should it be granted to me to live a hundred and ten years, I hope that a vital and true comprehension of nature may radiate from every one of my lines and dots. I invite those who are going to live as long as I to convince themselves whether I shall keep my word. Written at the age of seventy-five years by me, formerly Hokusai, now called The Old Man Mad with Painting. Like most of the ukiyo-e artists, he was born of the artisan class, the son of a mirror-maker. Apprenticed to the artist Shunso, he was expelled for originality and went back to his family to live in poverty and hardship throughout his long life. Unable to live by painting, he peddled food and almanacs. When his house burned down, he merely composed a hoka. It has burned down. How serene the flowers in their falling! When at the age of eighty-nine he was discovered by death, he surrendered reluctantly, saying, If the gods had given me only ten years more, I could have become a really great painter. He left behind him five hundred volumes of thirty thousand drawings. Intoxicated with the unconscious artistry of natural forms, he pictured in loving and varied repetition mountains, rocks, rivers, bridges, waterfalls, and the sea. Having issued a book of thirty-six views of Fuji, he went back, like the fascinated priest of Buddhist legend who, having been exiled from Japan, sailed every day across the sea to gaze upon the holy mountain, to sit at the foot of the sacred mount again and draw one hundred views of Fuji. In a series named The Imagery of the Poets, he returned to the loftier subjects of Japanese art and showed, among others, the great Li Po beside the chasm and cascade of Lu. In 1812 he issued the first of fifteen volumes called Mangwa, a series of realistic drawings of the homeliest details of common life, piquant with humor and scandalous with burlesque. These he flung off without care or effort, a dozen a day, until he had illustrated every nook and cranny of plebeian Japan. Never had the nation seen such fertility, such swift and penetrating conception, such reckless vitality of execution. As American critics looked down upon Whitman, so Japanese critics and art circles looked down upon Hokusai, seeing only the turbulence of his brush and the occasional vulgarity of his mind. But when he died, his neighbors, who had not known that Whistler, in a modest moment, would rank him as the greatest painter since Velázquez, marveled to see so long a funeral issue from so simple a home. Less famous in the West but more respected in the East was the last great figure of the ukiyo-e school, Hiroshige, 1796-1858. The hundred thousand distinct prints that claim his parentage picture the landscapes of his country more faithfully than Hokusai's, and with an art that has earned Hiroshige rank as probably the greatest landscape painter of Japan. Hokusai, standing before nature, drew not the scene but some airy fantasy suggested by it to his imagination. Hiroshige loved the world itself in all its forms, and drew these so loyally that the traveler may still recognize the objects and contours that inspired him. About 1830 he set out along the Tokaido, or post road from Tokyo to Kyoto, and, like a true poet, thought less of his goal than of the diverting and significant scenes which he met on his way. When at last his trip was finished, he gathered his impressions together in his most famous work, The Fifty-Three Stations of the Tokaido, 1834. He liked to picture rain and the night in all their mystic forms, and the only man who surpassed him in this, Whistler, modeled his nocturnes upon Hiroshige's. He too loved Fuji and made thirty-six views of the mountain, but also he loved his native Tokyo and made one hundred views of Yedo shortly before he died. He lived less years than Hokusai, but yielded up the torch with more content. I leave my brush at Azuma and go on the journey to the Holy West to visit the famous scenery there. An excellent collection of Hiroshige's prints may be seen in the Boston Museum.
11. Japanese Art and Civilization A Retrospect, Contrasts, An Estimate, The Doom of the Old Japan The Japanese print was almost the last phase of that subtle and delicate civilization which crumbled under the impact of Occidental industry, just as the cynical pessimism of the Western mind today may be the final aspect of a civilization doomed to die under the heel of Oriental industry. Because that medieval Japan which survived till 1853 was harmless to us, we can appreciate its beauty patronizingly, and it will be hard to find in a Japan of competing factories and threatening guns the charm that lures us in the selected loveliness of the past. We know, in our prosaic moments, that there was much cruelty in that old Japan, that peasants were poor and workers were oppressed, that women were slaves there and might in hard times be sold into promiscuity, that life was cheap, and that in the end there was no law for the common man but the sword of the samurai. But in Europe, too, men were cruel and women were a subject class, peasants were poor and workers were oppressed, life was hard and thought was dangerous, and in the end there was no law but the will of the lord or the king. And as we can feel some affection for that old Europe because, in the midst of poverty, exploitation, and bigotry, men built cathedrals in which every stone was carved in beauty, or martyred themselves to earn for their successors the right to think, or fought for justice until they created those civil liberties which are the most precious and precarious portion of our inheritance, so behind the bluster of the samurai we honor the bravery that still gives to Japan a power above its numbers and its wealth. Behind the lazy monks we sense the poetry of Buddhism and acknowledge its endless incentives to poetry and art. Behind the sharp blow of cruelty and the seeming rudeness of the strong to the weak we recognize the courtliest manners, the most pleasant ceremonies, and an unrivaled devotion to nature's beauty in all her forms. Behind the enslavement of women we see their beauty, their tenderness, and their incomparable grace, and amid the despotism of the family we hear the happiness of children playing in the garden of the East. We are not much moved today by the restrained brevity and untranslatable suggestiveness of Japanese poetry, and yet it was this poetry, as well as the Chinese, that suggested the free verse and imagism of our time. There is scant originality in Japan's philosophers, and in her historians a dearth of the high impartiality that we expect of those whose books are not an annex to their country's armed or diplomatic force. But these were minor things in the life of Japan. She gave herself wisely to the creation of beauty rather than to the pursuit of truth. The soil she lived on was too treacherous to encourage sublime architecture, and yet the houses she built are, from the aesthetic point of view, the most perfect ever designed. No country in modern times has rivaled her in the grace and loveliness of little things. The clothing of the women, the artistry of fans and parasols, of cups and toys, of inro and netsuke, the splendor of lacquer and the exquisite carving of wood. No other modern people has quite equaled the Japanese in restraint and delicacy of decoration, or in widespread refinement and sureness of taste. It is true that Japanese porcelain is less highly valued, even by the Japanese, than that of Sung and Ming. But if only the Chinese product surpasses it, the work of the Japanese potter still ranks above that of the modern European. And though Japanese painting lacks the strength and depth of Chinese, and Japanese prints are mere poster art at their worst, and at their best the transient redemption of hurried trivialities with the national perfection of grace and line, nevertheless it was Japanese rather than Chinese painting, and Japanese prints rather than Japanese watercolors, that revolutionized pictorial art in the nineteenth century, and gave the stimulus to a hundred experiments in fresh creative forms. These prints, sweeping into Europe in the wake of reopened trade after 1860, profoundly affected Monet, Manet, Degas, and Whistler. They put an end to the brown sauce that had been served with almost every European painting from Leonardo to Millet. They filled the canvases of Europe with sunshine and encouraged the painter to be a poet rather than a photographer. The story of the beautiful, said Whistler, with the swagger that made all but his contemporaries love him, is already complete, hewn in the marbles of the Parthenon, embroidered with the birds upon the fan of Hokusai at the foot of Fujiyama. We hope that this is not quite true, but it was unconsciously true for the old Japan. She died four years after Hokusai. In the comfort and peace of her isolation she had forgotten that a nation must keep abreast of the world if it does not wish to be enslaved. While Japan carved her inro and flourished her fans, Europe was establishing a science that was almost entirely unknown to the East, and that science, built up year by year in laboratories apparently far removed from the stream of the world's affairs, at last gave Europe the mechanized industries that enabled her to make the goods of life more cheaply, however less beautifully, than Asia's skillful artisans could turn them out by hand.
Sooner or later, those cheaper goods would win the markets of Asia, ruining the economic and changing the political life of countries pleasantly becalmed in the handicraft stage. Worse than that, science made explosives, battleships, and guns that could kill a little more completely than the sword of the most heroic samurai. Of what use was the bravery of a knight against the dastardly anonymity of a shell? There is no more amazing or portentous phenomenon in modern history than the way in which sleeping Japan, roughly awakened by the cannon of the West, leaped to the lesson, bettered the instruction, accepted science, industry, and war, defeated all her competitors either in battle or in trade, and became within two generations the most aggressive nation in the contemporary world. Chapter 31. The Last Chapter. The New Japan. 1. Political Revolution. The Decay of the Shogunate. America Knocks at the Door. The Restoration. The Westernization of Japan. Political Reconstruction. The New Constitution. Law. The Army. The War with Russia. Its Political Results. The death of a civilization seldom comes from without. Internal decay must weaken the fiber of a society before external influences or attacks can change its essential structure or bring it to an end. A ruling family rarely contains within itself that persistent vitality and subtle adaptability which enduring domination requires. The founder exhausts half the strength of the stock and leaves to mediocrity the burdens that only genius could bear. The Tokugawas after Ieyasu governed moderately well, but, barring Yoshimune, they numbered no positive personalities in their line. Within eight generations after Ieyasu's death, the feudal barons were disturbing the shogunate with sporadic revolts. Taxes were delayed or withheld, and the Yedo treasury, despite desperate economies, became inadequate to finance national security or defense. Two centuries and more of peace had softened the samurai and had disaccustomed the people to the hardships and sacrifices of war. Epicurean habits had displaced the stoic simplicity of Hideyoshi's days, and the country, suddenly called upon to protect its sovereignty, found itself physically and morally unarmed. The Japanese intellect fretted under the exclusion of foreign intercourse and heard with restless curiosity of the rising wealth and buried civilization of Europe and America. It studied Mabuchi and Motoori and secretly branded the shoguns as usurpers who had violated the continuity of the imperial dynasty. It could not reconcile the divine descent of the emperor with the impotent poverty to which the Tokugawas had condemned him. From their hiding places in the Yoshiwara and elsewhere, subterranean pamphleteers began to flood the cities with passionate appeals for the overthrow of the shogunate and the restoration of imperial power. Upon this harassed and resourceless government, the news burst in 1853 that an American fleet, ignoring Japanese prohibitions, had entered Uraga Bay and that its commander insisted upon seeing the supreme authority in Japan. This book is continued on Cassette 13, Side 1.